start recording. All right, so we are week 13. Again, this is um, the week before, I think before Thanksgiving. I don't even know because I don't know when Thanksgiving is since I am not going anywhere. Um, so we, again, are not doing any more in-person labs because of COVID. This Thursday, we will do a lab on Zoom. Next week, because it's Thanksgiving week, we will not have any lab Zooms because um, you do get Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday off. We will still have lecture next Monday. Again, you have three labs on ADILT due this week over the kidney and the tubular function and histology. Um, and we will go through a lot of that material on the models in our Zoom call on Thursday. All right. Um, so there's a lot to get done this week. And then next week is to try to start getting into our acid-base balance. And that week, even though it's Thanksgiving week, you still will have an ADILT lab. And then our last week of lecture, we have to get the reproduction. And that week, you will have one more ADILT lab. And then you will have a quiz, then you have a test, and then you have a lab, and then you have the final exam. Okay, um, we were, I was going to get the computer lab for our final exam so you could come and take it at school, proctored by me. But now, again, with the COVID numbers at their highest, there is no more in person. Um, classes for the biology, and I think chemistry has done this as well. So uh, if you want or need to come to campus, if I, I am going to be there on Thursdays, I am going also today um, to do a few things. So let me know, and if it is that you need my assistance, I can get you in and get you something copied or get you something uh, printed off or get you some pictures taken. Um, just let me know, okay? All right. So. Moving to this, um, hopefully you can see this. All right, so again, as I promised, we are we are on the nephron, all right? And so just to review, again, our nephron, we are going to have blood vessels come in, and then we're going to have blood vessels leave. So the blood vessel coming in is our afferent arterial. And our blood vessel leaving is our efferent arterial. Okay, the the sac that is going to again contain a little bit of open space where the capillaries are going to allow the filtration, the plasma to be pushed into this nephron. This whole thing again is the renal or nephron corpuscle. Okay. Um, so the core puzzle, all right? And again, the capillary bed for filtration is known as the glomerulus, all right? And then the part of the connective tissue capsule and the epithelial tissue that makes a little barrier that the filtrate is kind of being captured in. So it's like the top of the ball. That is known as the capsule. And sometimes you hear it as the Bowman's capsule all right, or the nephron capsule, okay? And then that is going to enter into a tube, and again, it's going to be this convoluted tube, so that's the proximal convoluted tube. Then you will enter into a loop called the loop of Henley, or the nephron loop, and then you'll go through a distal convoluted tube, and then the distal convoluted tube will join many other nephron distal convoluted tubes in a collecting duct. Okay, now for histology purposes, okay, we have that our, let me see if I can get this, all right. We are going to see that in our corpuscle here, okay, there is going to be a few layers of cells that are going to interact and form the barrier that prevents red blood cells, white blood cells, and our albumin protein from exiting out of the blood, okay? So remember, a capillary all right, is going to have lots of simple squamous epithelium, okay? And we call those simple squamous epithelium endothelium cells, 
All right. So in our glomerulus, we are still going to have endothelial cells, simple squamous epithelium. What we're going to notice is there are going to be more breaks or opening in between our simple squamous epithelium. So that's why it's known as a fenestrated, which is, again, go back in chapter 21. It's a more uh, porous or open, holy uh, type of capillary where there is room when we force fluid out for more fluid, more plasma to exit out of the capillary bed. Okay, so one of the histological, histological layers of the corpuscle is the glomerulus is going to be a capillary that has, again, fenestrated, so simple squamous cells that are a little more open framework, a little more porous, a little more openings between the cells to allow more fluid, more plasma to exit. Now, these holes are pretty big. So what we're going to see is there is going to be a layer of cells that are going to wrap around okay and are going to try to form the openings or in and around the openings some slits that are going to try to basically prevent our red blood cells our white blood cells and our bumin from leaving all right and these cells that are going to form these kind of again kind of overlapping finger like um interactions are going to be known as podocytes, and it's listed over here, okay? And remember, anytime we talk about the visceral layer, it's the inner layer. So for the capsule, the layer of cells that are on or directly around the glomerulus, so more inside, are going to be the podocytes, okay? Then there's going to be a little bit of space and then we're going to see the parietal or the outer layer is going to have some traditional simple squamous epithelium. And then behind it is going to be some connective tissue that is going to form that outer corpuscle and capsule uh, layering. Okay, so the corpuscle has quite a few epithelial layers, right? It's got the endothelial layer of the again glomerulus where the endothelial cells are simple squamous epithelium they have more openings more um, big gaps between the cells to allow again more fluid to flow out to keep again those huge gaps from still not letting again the um the big cells and big proteins from leaving two cells are going to take like their little fingers and it's kind of like if you were to put the two your hands together with the fingers uh, basket weaving the the slit is still going to let a lot of fluid and small solutes pass but the podocytes this epithelial layer of cells with their finger like projections around and near big gaps on the endothelial glomerulus layer are going to try and prevent again the big items from leaving the blood plasma and only let the small solutes suspended in the plasma water from exiting out. That space between the podocytes is going to then be filling with fluid. And again, because we have a tube, the next layer of the capsule is going to be another layer of simple squamous cells that are going to be tied to, again, connective tissue behind it that's going to form the parietal or the outside layer, the outside piece component of the whole corpuscle. Okay? When we move into the proximal convoluted tubule, we are going to see that the proximal convoluted tubule is rich in simple cuboidal cells, all right? So simple cuboidal cells, and those cells are going to have lots of microvilli. They are also going to have lots of mitochondria. Now, Microvilli, remember, in a cell, microvilli is the plasma membrane 
um, is going to rise and fall a lot, okay? And that is going to provide lots of surface area for lots of receptors embedded in the plasma membrane to interact and push into the lumen of the tube. And so if I have a lot of protein receptors embedded in this membrane, I have a lot of potential then to bring lots of molecules by their protein receptor from outside the cell in that tubular fluid inside the cell into the cytoplasm. Now, once I get things inside the cell, remember that things like sodium, there's not a lot of sodium inside the cell and there's a lot of sodium outside the cell. And so to get sodium that's come into the cell from maybe my tube, I am going to, again, usually bring sodium in easily across that microvilli, but to get sodium from this inside environment outside into the extracellular space where it could potentially be picked up by my paratubular capillaries, I am going to have to pump it. And remember, anytime I have to pump something, I'm going to need to make ATP. So part of having all the mitochondria in these simple cuboidal cells is because for every molecule that I might bring in from my tube, from my filtrate, and bring it in to the cell to keep the cell from hoarding it and to keep the cell from maybe overpopulating itself with items that it normally doesn't have a lot of inside, I am going to have to use an ATPA pump to get those items out and get them into the extracellular space on the uh, basement side of my cells that can then potentially then be picked up through lymphatic vessels, picked up by my paratubular capillary vessels, and that molecule and those solutes of importance can then be returned and reutilized in my body versus what stays in my tray is going to then continue in the tubing and might not ever get picked again. Okay, so again, if you look at these cuboidal cells, they need a lot of mitochondria and they need a lot of microvilli, so they can put as many protein molecules to interact and re be receptors and, and gated channels and voltage channels and ligand channels and co-transporters to get as many of the molecules of importance out of the filtrate and back into the cell, and then ultimately from the cell, back into the lymphatic or the paratubular capillaries by pumping those molecules into that environment, okay? Now, the loop is gonna be interesting. In the loop, you're gonna have areas that are going to be thick and areas that are going to be thin. In the thin segments, we are going to see simple squamous epithelium. In the thick segments, we're going to see um, simple, again, cuboidal cells, all right? And these simple cuboidal cells and these simple squamous cells, they are going to be selective. So they are going to be cells that at times, all right, and in certain conditions, they are not gonna let certain things move. So in some cases, the um, simple squamous is going to only let water move by osmosis and nothing else. The simple cuboidal cells in the thick segments are going to be water impermeable. That means between the cells, there is going to be no ability for water to swing or slip through, and water is not going to be able to leave the loop in the thick segments. Okay, and there's the descending limb and there's the ascending limb. And depending upon if you have a cortical nephron or a juxtaglomedullary nephron, all right, the areas that are thick and the areas that are thin might have more, let's say, room to be part of a longer tube or might not have much room to really exist. And that goes back to, again, why our cortical nephrons do not maybe do as great a job of returning as much of the filtrate to the body as our juxtamedullary. Because again, if you have a longer loop and you have more room 
to pull in solutes to make a really salty. Again, out here is super salty. That means there's going to be lots of sodium, lots of urea, lots of potassium, lots of chloride, lots of amino acids, lots of whatever solutes I can have. I'm going to have a buttload of them. And then the water then in the tube is going to be in an area of low solute concentration. And because the outside area is high solute concentration, I am going to have a huge way to draw water back into my extracellular space, back into my potential space that can then take that water through lymphatics and take up that water through the uh, paratubular capillaries and return it to my body. Okay. Now, the distal convoluted tubule, we are back again fully into those simple cuboidal cells. And what you're going to notice is there's less robustness to the membrane interacting with the fluid. By the time you got to the distal convoluted tubule, most of what you've wanted to return to the body has happened. And so remember that this is where hormones come into play. And so the hormones are going to come from the paratubular capillaries. They are going to bind to their receptors and then binding to their receptors either on the membrane down here at the lumen side, the basement membrane side of the cell, or intracellular capillaries and then going into the nucleus and changing some uh, DNA and, and transcription, translation of proteins. That could then potentially make this area have more or less receptors for maybe the calcium ions if we want to retain calcium because of the calcitonin parathyroid hormone influences. Or we want to, again, maybe kick out more potassium and therefore retain more sodium and water because aldosterone's effects on the distal convoluted tubule to, re, uh, to remove or dump potassium. Okay, um, so again, the proximal, I mean, the distal convoluted tubule is going to have some simple cuboidal cells, but how much of the membrane and how many receptors and how active those receptors are on the membrane of these simple cuboidal cells is going to come back to, again, the hormones and the influence of the hormone and their receptors on these cells. Okay. When we get to the collecting duct, and again, remember the collecting duct technically belongs to many nephrons, not one, but the collecting duct is also going to have those simple cuboidal cells. And again, just like with the distal convoluted tubule, they are going to be cells that are going to um, only have certain protein channels on their membranes known as aquaporons that are going to let water be retained under the influence of the hormone ADH. Okay. So other than water being retained under ADH being present, the collecting duct does not give us much opportunity to take anything else back. So in the collecting duct, if ADH is present, I will let water be retained. If ADH is not present, whatever this little droplet is that comes in, whatever is in that droplet is lost. It's going to become urine. It's going to head to the renal pelvis, then to the ureters, then to the bladder, and that's it. So your last ditch effort for water is ADH hormone from your posterior pituitary telling the distal collecting duct simple cuboidal cells to put their water protein allowing membrane receptors on their membrane and letting that water be retained or not being there at all and letting nothing come across these collecting duct cells. Okay. Now, again, uh, didn't mean to do that. Okay. Again, looking at the nephron, I really like this picture because I think it does a really good job to show you when you're coming again into, oops, sorry, I don't mean to do that. All right. If blood is coming, stop, stop. Okay. If blood is coming, I want the red pin. Okay. 
if blood is oh my god I'm having an issue here all right okay oh wait okay now if blood is coming in all right through my afferent nephron okay and again afferent nephrons they are gonna have again simple cuboidal cells and then around those simple cuboidal cells will be a layer or two of smooth muscle cells and it's these smooth muscle cells that can constrict or dilate making the lumen of the afferent arterial get bigger or get smaller if these smooth muscle cells constrict the afferent arterial is going to be smaller whole and less fluid will get into the glomerulus if the smooth muscle cells on the afferent arterial dilate my lumen is going to get bigger and that's going to let more blood into my glomerulus and so that is going to potentially get more filtration more capillary hydrostatic fluid pressure to let more fluid into the hose into the glomerulus to then leak out of the the fenestrated pores that the glomerulus has okay so again in the afferent arterial you have those simple squamous cells you can kind of see it a little bit right here and then you have smooth muscle cells around all right the smooth muscle cell in the afferent arterial can get a special name known as juxta glomerular cells so the smooth muscle cells in the afferent arterial can be known as juxta glomerular cells okay now the blood is going to come into the glomerulus. Again, you can kind of see all these little holes. All right, let's see if I can make it a little bigger. Okay, all these little holes, and you can kind of see the cell is, again, got some pores, got some holes to it. These are my, again, endothelial squamous cells. You can see this layering of cell here is that parietal layer and you see how these little finger-like interactions between two cells kind of cover the holes that are created by the endothelial cells and so what that creates is a little bit of like filter paper around my um my colander and so it lets the fluid and small solutes leak out and not my red blood cells and not my white blood cells and not hopefully any of my albumin okay and so here are those again podocyte cells and that's considered again the part of the corpuscle part of the capsule of the corpuscle and the visceral layer of the corpuscle the visceral layer of the capsule and then if you look over here see that there's space and then you start to see these simple squamous cells and then you see this connective tissue behind it this is going to again be the parietal all right layer of the capsule the podocyte and the simple squamous cell create this space and this is where we start to collect the plasma that's leaking out and this plasma once it's in the space we're now going to call filtrate okay one other thing i like is this becomes the pct and so what do you see happening you turn into those simple cuboidal with very rich microvilli cells show up. And then over here, this is my DCT. And you can see again, these are simple cuboidal cells. And this special population, so in the DCT, this special population of simple cuboidal cells that are going to be very close to my smooth muscle cells of my afferent arteria, uh, arterial that are known as my juxtaglomerular cells, these special cells are going to be known as macula densa 
cells. Okay, they are still simple cuboidal cells of the DCT. Here it's spelled out. But we're going to learn the JG cells, the macula densa cells, these are all involved in a feedback loop. So this is part of how I can tell if I have an assembly line. So if I collect, here's my collecting dock, and then I put things through an assembly line. At the end of the assembly line, if I want to check that I have basically gotten all of the items I bought, into my warehouse minus maybe just the cardboard and the shipping packaging waste I would want this checkpoint to basically feed back to this side of I am putting the items on the assembly line at the appropriate rate and the appropriate amount if at this point I am um, over filling my assembly line and I'm beginning to have product that is lost because I am letting things get too big too fast on the assembly line I would want my feedback loop to send to slow down or to decrease product on the assembly line if on this assembly line this is uh, so devoid of even packaging that when I feed back this is too low or too slow I need to speed up and increase my assembly line product getting onto this onto the turner belt um, that that is kind of a little bit of fact for this one nephron to be able to see for how much I'm taking am I doing a decent job of getting all the important parts back and leaving the waste or am I getting so little product that I'm getting so much back that I'm actually taking some of my waste products even back or I'm at that happy medium point where what I'm taking is adequately being pulled back in and enough waste is being lost that this is the perfect kind of assembly conveyor belt speed and amount of product on the conveyor belt going through the system Okay, and so these JG cells and these macula densa cells are communicating based on the macula densa cells. They can sense pH, they can sense solute, um, like uh, oncotic pressure, uh, and they can tell the JG cells to constrict if too much of the product is potentially being lost, meaning the pH isn't acidic enough, the solutes are maybe too, um, too much water still, and the solutes are still basically a low solute concentration. I could constrict my JG, make my filtrate amount decrease, so therefore as I move through the tubes, I can try to get a better return of products in that filtrate back into my system. If this is so salty and so, uh, you know, acidic that obviously the JG cells are too constricted and the amount of product being put on the conveyor being put in the tube is being uh, basically reabsorbed at such a rate that what's left is not enough loss of water, a loss of material to be efficient and effective for helping my body, then I could tell those JG cells to dilate. All right? And this feedback is super important because, again, if I have uh, again, 10 neuron, nephrons that work and only one guy sucks and so my JG cells constrict and this one guy only gets, you know, a little portion of the blood and the other nine take up the slack, well, that's not a big deal. But if I get to a place where five nephrons have JG cells constricting and five nephrons are still decent at their job, I start to maybe not um, still have decent amounts of filtration and return and I might start to realize that the shunting and the moving of fluid to to nephrons that are efficient at their job, good at their job, you can't have five workers do the 10. And so usually when people figure out they have kidney disease, they are figuring out that enough of their nephrons suck at the job and the ones left trying to compensate for their 
decrepit, sucky brothers is not is not going to be a sufficient amount to continue to keep the blood in the body adequately at the right blood pressure, at the right hydration level, at the right pH, the right amount of sodium, potassium, and chloride. And so when you hear about people going on dialysis, again, we put you on a machine because your kidneys suck at doing their job. You don't hear about people going on dialysis one day a week. By the time you get this many nephrons sucking and this few amount of nephrons trying to compensate that you then say, well, let's put you on dialysis. Chances are people go on dialysis for four, five, six, seven days, if possible, a week. And so that's because, again, the kidneys have gotten to the place where the nephrons can't keep up. Okay, so we've done a lot so far. We've gone through, again, what are the parts of the nephron? We've gone through what are the, again, histological layers of the nephron? And in each segment, what are the histological layers and why? And we've gone through that there are some special places where the histological layers are going to have some specially named cells that are going to play a role in, again, making the filtrate be a certain way, meaning without white blood cells, without red blood cells, like podocytes do, without any albumin. And then we'll have other places where the cells in and around histologically are going to get special names, and they're going to be involved in uh, feedback and osmotic and pH um, sensing so they can then again correctly tie in the nephron filtrate taken is the adequate amount to get the desired exiting out of a certain amount of water, a certain amount of molecules and waste products to be effective at helping the body maintain its balance of water, its balance of um, of molecules and cells. Okay, so let's go through the glomerulus, let's go through the uh, corpuscle, the capsule, and let's revisit glomerular filtration. Okay, so again, this comes back from chapter 21, and if you remember, it was the equation where we had the capillary hydrostatic pressure minus the interstitial hydrostatic pressure and this is filtration force that usually forces fluid out and then we had the oncotic capillary pressure minus the oncotic interstitial pressure and this again was albumin being that fixed solute and this is normally reabsorption forces that pull water and solutes in, okay? And remember from chapter 21 that this is the main component we control, and we control by dilating or constricting the material directly in front of it, or back up and we make our mean blood pressure that we create at the left ventricle pushing stroke volume into the aorta, right, we can make mean blood pressure go up and down, okay? So when we look at filtration that's occurring, all right, we see that this hydrostatic component is the main force still making plasma leave and exit and enter into this capsule space. Okay, and we see that the oncotics and the albumin is still going to be part of the forces that draw a little bit of the fluid back in and keep the blood plasma from becoming all formed else. Okay, and so when we look at, again, if I have one milliliter of blood, going into this afferent arterial into this glomerulus. Remember that this is going to be 60% plasma on average, and it's only this plasma that is going to be filtrated out. And we are going to, by this capillary filtration pressure, all right, tend to force out fluid. We're going to try to reabsorb a little bit for oncotics, but the net effect is that of this plasma in this one mill of blood, 
some of it is going to stay in this capsule and then begin its journey through the proximal convoluted tube. And the blood that leaves might be now 0.9 mils, but it's still going to be all the red blood cells that were in there before, all the white blood cells that were in before, and all the albumin. And so while the blood leaving is a little bit less in total volume, chances are the formed elements have probably become maybe 42 or 43 percent, and my plasma is now 57 or 56 percent of the blood. And it shows us that what we've lost is plasma. Okay? And then that plasma is going to now be, in this picture, this is the filtrate. And initially, this filtrate is equal to plasma. Okay? That means when we let that filtrate into the capsule, if this was 92% water, this is 92% water. If this had 1% um, sodium, this is 1% sodium. If this had, you know, um, one glucose per liter, this has one glucose per liter, all right? If this had one amino acid per liter, this has one amino acid per liter, all right? If this had, again, um, one creatine molecule per liter, this has one creatine molecule per liter, okay? So, when I look at the filtrate, initially the filtrate is just the plasma minus the albumin, okay? So the pH here is going to be 7.4 because what was the filtrate pH? It's going to be the plasma pH. What is the plasma pH? It's 7.4, all right? What is the concentration of the hydrogens in here? Well, it is what the concentration of the plasma hydrogen its ions were. What is the concentration of the bicarb? It is going to be what the concentration of the bicarb is. So when I start fluid in my proxonvoluted tubule, my filtrate is basically the same as my plasma without the albumin being present. Okay, now as I flow, so as I flow through this proximal convoluted tubule, this is my filtrate in here. And what I'm going to see is that, again, all of these microvilli are going to have lots of receptor proteins embedded in them so that I can use that sodium ions are in high concentration outside cells. And that's going to be true for the sodium concentration inside versus the sodium concentration in this filtrate. All right, so sodium is going to want to go into these PCT cells because of concentration. And then remember, this cell has lots of negative molecules. So sodium is also going to want to go into this cell because it's a positive molecule and there's lots of negative molecules inside the cytoplasm of the cell. So when sodium has a receptor that lets it move into the cell, I am going to use that sodium being driven into the cell by its concentration and by its electrical gradient to help also pull in many other solutes that are part of the filtrate from the plasma. So that is going to be how I pull in glucose. That is going to be how I pull in my amino acids like tyrosine, tryptophan, glutamate, alanine. That is going to be how I pull in some of my pyruvate, some of my lactate. That is going to be how I pull in some chloride ions and how I pull in some of my phosphate ions. Okay? I am just going to let glucose hitch a ride with sodium, and I'm going to move sodium and glucose into the cell. Now remember, sodium is high outside the cell, 
and I want to keep sodium ions low inside the cell. So as sodium and glucose and sodium and lactate and sodium and chloride and sodium and tyrosine and sodium and alanine and sodium and tryptophan come in, I am going to have to expend energy and pump sodium out so I can keep sodium gradient pulling in from the filtrate. So the PCT is full of these, what's going on on the side of the cell with the filtrate is I am going to use sodium coming in by its concentration and electrical gradient to pull in other molecules. And then to keep the sodium gradient to a place where sodium wants to come into the cell and it doesn't accumulate, I am going to do lots of active transport lots of pumping on my lumen side of the cell to keep sodium out of the cell in high amounts, low amounts inside the cell, and keep my ability to pull in all of these other molecules. Okay? Now, some of my other molecules, again, might be able to move by osmosis and by just movement of water. Some might have to, again, undergo some active transport, some endocytosis, and some making of vesicles, all right? And that's going to require energy. And while I'm bringing a lot of into the cell, one thing to notice is in the PCT, I am also forcing hydrogen ions into the filtrate. And I'm using carbonic acid, and I'm using the fact that carbon dioxide as a gas can freely move by its concentration gradient across cell membranes to help get more carbon dioxide to flow into my cells. I make carbon uh, carbonic acid. Hydrogens are pumped out with sodium flowing in. And bicarb is pumped into my extracellular environment. And again, this is keeping my extracellular environment slightly alkaline. The hydrogen pumping in is starting to make pH and the PCT slowly become more acidic. So maybe by the end of the PCT, this is a pH of 6. Maybe it's a pH of 5.5 because as hydrogens are pushed out, I am making more hydrogen in this extracellular environment. Now remember, in my plasma, I did have a initially a lot of bicarb and so to help get those bicarb some of these hydrogens are going to combine with the bicarb form carbonic acid disassociate form carbon dioxide and water carbon dioxide is going to come in disassociate hydrogen is kicked out so I'm going to be recovering some of my bicarbs through this little kind of process of using my two versions of what's happening inside the cell and what's happening outside the cell to lead to more hydrogens being pushed out and more bicarbs being pulled in. Okay? So at the end of the PCT, through this process, I should, all right, I should see uh, that my Oh, sorry. I should see that at the end of my PCT, okay, what am I doing? Come on. Sometimes this thing does not want to work very well for me. Okay. Uh, so by the end of my PCT, here we go, okay, um, my filtrate. So if I started, here's my glomerulus. Let's say I made one mil of filtrate. By the end of my PCT, what started out as filtrate, that was one milliliter, and it had a pH of 7.4. It had the exact same number of solutes as plasma, right? By the end of my PCT, I should be at 0.4 mils, meaning 60% of the filtrate has been retained. 
okay? So 60% is retained. I should see if the pH is 7.4 at the start, my pH down here is going to maybe be acidic. So it's going to be that the hydrogen ion population has increased to make the pH drop to an acidic number. I am going to see that the population of bicarb, all right, that was that was present in the plasma has now dropped significantly. I am going to see hopefully any and all glucose is now gone. I hope to see any and all amino acids are now gone. So the PCT is going to be the major location where I return and collect back most of the solutes, the water, and the molecules of importance for my body. Okay? And so when I enter into my loop, which is what follows the PCT, I am over halfway with what I still need to return to the system. Okay? And I should have no glucose, no amino acids, no lactate, very few of those important organic molecules left in my PCT. The reasoning glucose or amino acids would still be in this area would only occur if there is some type of disease or overabundance meaning that the glucose is so high in my plasma of my blood that so much of it is present that when I usually take 300 molecules back in, there is still some left, all right? And that's usually, when that happens, that's usually the disease of diabetes in play. Amino acids would normally only end up in overabundance if we are potentially doing some type of crazy over protein intake and diet and uh, and then making and making available so many amino acids that we really can't take back all the tryptophan and the alanine and the tyrosine, all right? So usually, again, we return all of our glucose, our pyruvate, our lactate, our amino acids in the PCT, and we do so, again, because normal conditions, normal healthy bodies, we don't overproduce it, overmake it, or have it over in abundance because of our hormones, our metabolism, and our um, metabolic functions are working clean, okay? So that's the takeaway with the PCT. When we get into the loop, all right, and again, the loop is going to have areas where we are seeing th and we are seeing thin, okay? The thin areas are going to only let water be retained, all right? And the thin areas are going to let water be retained in that this outside extracellular environment is going to start to see high concentrations of solutes. Now, to understand solutes, what does this 300 mean? What does this 600 mean? Right, this is how I'm going to explain it to you. If I have a container, and in this container is one liter of water, okay, for just keeping it somewhat simple, most of the time our body water is going to have 300 solutes suspended in this one liter. Okay, and again, if we do the math, we're going to say that means there are 300 solutes per liter. Okay, now, when we get to the medulla of our, where our pyramids are, remember the upside down pyramids? Okay, all right, in this area, the body water is going to have 
more and more solutes. So this little segment of body water, if there's one liter, it's going to have 400 molecules suspended in it. So it's going to have a few extra. Then this segment is going to have 600. And then this segment can have up to 1,200. So what that means is if I take a liter from here, all right, there are 400 molecules in that liter. If I take a liter from here, there's going to be 1,200 molecules suspended in that liter. Okay? And so again, as I go through the PCT, I am going to start with 300 molecules per liter, and I'm going to end with 300 molecules per liter. Okay? The molecules that are in here are now mostly hydrogen ions. All right, there's still some sodium ions, there's still some chloride, there's still some potassium, there will be potentially creatine in there, there will be some, again, if I had cells explode, some hemoglobin, some bilirubin, some urea. But the 300 molecules at the end of my PCT is going to be more hydrogens, more urea, more of the waste products and less of a mix of other molecules like glucose and pyruvate and amino acids, okay? Now, when I go into my loop, all right, again, this 300 is going to be creatine, it's going to be sodium, it's going to be hydrogens, it's still going to be some potassium, there still can be some bicarb, um, there still can be some calcium, there still can be some potential small proteins or molecules, okay? Those molecules are going to not be able to leave, okay? So the outside environment is going to have more molecules, and the concentration of this water is going to get to be 600 molecules suspended in a liter. So what the water in here is going to want to do is the water is going to want to drain to make these solutes have to now become suspended in a smaller volume. So what was 300 molecules is now 600 molecules. Okay, so by water leaving, if I had, again, 0.4 mils here, I should get to this point and I'm at 0.2 mils. I still have the same number of solutes. If I had 50 molecules here, okay, I still have 50 molecules here. It's just the amount of fluid the 50 molecules are suspended in has dropped, so those molecules are suspended in less fluid, so the amount of molecules suspended in a liter looks like it's 600 molecules per liter. Okay, and then again, to go from here to here, I'm now at 1 or 0.1 mils because, again, those 50 molecules, in order to get into a solution of 600 milliosmoles per liter, I need the fluid to go from 0.2 milliliters to 0.1. And so now, all those molecules are suspended in this much fluid. Okay, and so if you look at that, the thin areas are where we are letting water move by osmosis. We are making the molecules left at the end of the PCT become suspended in smaller and smaller amounts. And those molecules, again, there's still 50 of them. There were 50 here, there were 50 here, they're still in there. Okay, and then when I go into the thick regions, now, if I have 0.1 mil here, I'm going to have 0.1 mil at the end, but instead of these 50 molecules being here, I'm going to be left with 10. And what I'm going to see is that I'm going to pull in as best I can through my simple cuboidal cells lining this loop, I am going to try to pull in the useful molecules still suspended in this fluid. And I'm going to try to leave the molecules whoop, that are still considered waste products, all right, and still 
back in this um, at the end of this tube. All right. And so again, if you look at the pictures here, hopefully it makes it a little bit more clear. So again, here I started with one mil. All right. By the time I'm here, I'm down to 0 0.6 mils. Okay. The number of solutes suspended is 300 here and 300 here. But each of these molecules are going to represent more likely waste molecules like hydrogens, all right, and urea, and things that I want to be in the filtrate, and the glucose, and the amino acids, and the important molecules are pulled back, okay? Then as I go down, again, if I had, I'm sorry, 0.4 mils here, okay, I am going to basically, hopefully, at this is 300, at 600, this is point now 2 mils, and at 1200, this is point 0.1 mil. Okay, the number of molecules have gotten to be, again, condensed into a smaller volume. And then what I do is, if this is point 0.1 mil, this is point 0.1 mil, but if this was 50 molecules right here for this little segment, now there's 10, and I pulled my best of my ability, all the important molecules out. That helps keep this area salty, okay? And it helps, again, get to a place where I have 0.1 mil, 90% returned from my original milliliter of filtrate, and the waste products in here are the waste products that I need to get rid of my out of my system, okay? And so what happens in the DCT and what happens in the collecting duct is now all hormones. And in this image here, this is the hormone ADH. And remember, ADH comes from the posterior pituitary. And in this image here, it shows you that if ADH is present, as I go back through the salty medulla, uh, if I had 0.1 mil here, all right, uh, and this is back to, again, about 100 molecules per liter. When I get to the 200 mark, I will be at 0.05. When I get to the 400 meter point, I should be at 0.025 milliliters. When I get to the 800 point, I should be at 0.0125. And so by the time you get this little droplet here. It is somewhere around 0 0.01 milliliters. That means 99% of my original one milliliter of filtrate has been returned. Okay? And suspended in this 0 0.1 milliliter of filtrate is, again, solutes that are waste primarily products, not anything that hopefully was important for metabolic physiological function in my system, all right? On the flip side, if there's no ADH, I have 0.1 mil here, I have 0.1 mil here, okay? And I only recovered 90, maybe, well, again, it's probably point because I did have a little bit here. So it's really not 0.1, but it's about 90, let's say 97% is recovered. This is probably 0 0.03 or 0 0.05, all right? And, uh, and so, again, it's a little bit of a larger droplet, okay? But it's going to be, again, a little bit more water loss, and it's going to, if you add up 0.3, uh, or 0 0.03 times one of these per minute, so after an hour, you know, how much fluid is in your bladder versus 0 0.01 times 60 minutes, how much fluid is in your bladder at the end of the hour, you're going to see that this is why we can sleep potentially eight hours without going to the bathroom versus this is why, again, as you're accumulating 0 0.1, 0 0.05, uh, half a mil, you know, um, so 0 0.0, 
0.05 is going to give you, I think, three milliliters in an hour, all right? And again, you're only trying to get to 20 milliliters before you start to have the urge to pee, so you're pretty close to being there. This is why if ADH is not present, every two to three hours, you feel like you got to go void your bladder um, because you're, again, not retaining as much water as efficiently and effectively, okay? Um, when we put it all together, again, here's the slide to summarize what's going on in the segments. Uh, again, you take a sampling of your blood plasma. What starts here is equal, so filtrate equals plasma. Then from here to here, you recover 60%, and you make the plasma uh, have the return of glucose and amino acids and important stuff and your pH here now starts to look acidic all right and you start to have your filtrate look the beginnings of what will be urine what you do from here to here again is the water what you do here is the uh, is the salts and what you get here is hopefully, 90% is returned. And what you do from this 90, I'm sorry, to 95% is been returned. And so this last bit through the DCT, this last bit through the collecting duct, that is what's going to get you to 99% and even 99.9%. .9%, okay. And the goal then being what ends up going into, again, your urine in your bladder. All right, it can be somewhere around 0 0.05 milliliters to 0 0.001 milliliters. And again, this is going to fill up your bladder much faster than this, causing you to maybe, again, pee every two to four hours, whereas something like this, you might feel the urge to pee every uh, five to eight hours. Okay. Um, and when the other thing to look at is because most of what's happening is before the DCT, your hormones are only getting to play with the last little uh, sampling of filtrate. So they're not seeing all of the filtrate in its glory at the beginning of the system. They're seeing all of the filtrate after the natural processes of retention and reabsorption have taken place and they're getting to play with you know filtering through trash filtering through you know we put our trash in our house in our trash cans we put it in the in the bins the trash man comes and picks it up they take all that trash and they put it in a big pile at the dump well what the hormones are doing is they're getting the filtrate that's kind of at the dump that is basically mostly trash and they're trying to find those last few gems of molecules that we want to retain to again physiologically let's just get a little bit more advantage come having the right amount of potassium the right amount of calcium the right amount of water balance okay all right so I'm going to stop sharing close that out that was a lot of information. Um.